Hi everybody, welcome to Pro Shop Talk. I'm Daniel, I'm the technical director here at the Masters Craft, and this is our series where we get to talk to some of our vendor partners about their products and the uh, tips, tricks, and techniques to apply them. So I'm excited to have Gene Jarka back on the uh, show today and talk to him a little bit more about Palman. So welcome on, Gene. Hey, good morning, and thanks for having me. Well, why don't you start off for uh, people who don't know you, just give us a quick introduction on, on who you are. So I've been with uh, Palman almost seven years now. I've uh, been on this side of the industry, as I like to say, for uh, going on 20 years. I've worked for a couple of other manufacturers. Before that, I worked for Michael Dittmer Wood Floors out of Putnam, Illinois, for about 20 years uh, in the sand and finish business. So. Happy to be here and uh, want to talk to you about Nature Seal and White Seal today. Awesome, sweet. So you've been around the block when it comes to sand and finish, and um, I'm sure that probably helps when it comes to a topic like this. So, um, like you said, we're talking about Nature Seal and White Seal, which are the uh, two light pigmented sealers that um, you guys at Palman supply. So um, I think. Contractors are probably getting more and more of an idea of uh, what pigmented sealers are now that they're permeating the market a little bit, but why don't you tell us about um, both of those products and kind of what they do, what their effect is, and then we'll, we'll get into a little bit more of the application of them. So specifically what we've got with Nature Seal and White Seal are, um, are two pigmented sealers. So Nature Seal is a sealer that's got about 1% white pigment in it, which will provide the appearance of a raw or untreated, unfinished floor for the contractor, which has become more and more popular these days. And the, whereas White Seal, you know, as the name implies, is also a white pigmented product, but it just got a higher, or higher percentage of white pigment added to it, where you can get that sort of whitewashed, frosty appearance without having to use a white stain. Okay, gotcha. So uh, Nature Seal would be a product, I guess, that has a little bit of white tint in it, and it sounds like the goal of that is to counteract the darkening effect that you get when you put a sealer or finish on the floor. So it kind of ends back at that natural look. Absolutely, so what that's gonna, yeah, Nature Seal in essence will give you the raw appearance Mm -hmm. Whereas we have another product that we call Clear. Clear, by contrast, is a clear waterborne sealer that gives the appearance of uh, a dampened cloth being wiped on the wood. Where Nature Seal, because it's got that little bit of white pigment, it counteracts, like you said, that darkening effect by adding moisture to the wood. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so... Uh, I guess talking about these a little bit, um, these are pigmented sealers, which can be a little tricky to apply um, or trickier to apply the more pigment that you put in the sealer. So let's talk a little bit about just the general process for how you would uh, apply these. So in terms of sanding, is there anything that you would do differently um, in, in sanding the floor to prepare for application? No, I mean, I would I would approach the sanding a, a lot uh, in in large part the same way I would approach it if I was going to apply any waterborne sealer. You mm -hmm. know, going to end up so, somewhere in that one hundred to one twenty range, where to me it seems like these days more and more I hear people finishing with either a one hundred paper or you know something similar to Norton's mesh power in a hundred grit. Um, yeah. And then obviously we're going to do all of our prep before we actually start applying product, you know, vacuum it, tack it, and uh, just get that floor as clean as possible before we apply our sealer. Gotcha. And then uh, because these are water-based sealers, if you're not staining the floor, there's no reason to water pop, correct? That is correct. Yeah. And when we're talking about application, both of these products, and it's on the box and on the label, on the front label of all mm -hmm. the gallons is, um, both of these sealers um, are intended to be rolled. 
And when I okay. say intended to be rolled, meaning that that is the applicator that you need to do use in order to achieve the effect that you're looking for. Because we've got a pigment suspended in these products, the best way um, to get that outcome that we're looking for is to use a roller to apply to evenly distribute that pigment throughout the floor. Gotcha. And probably another thing to highlight is to make sure and shake up and stir the gallons because that pigment probably settles to the bottom. Yeah, as you, well. absolutely, you want to give this both the gallons a pretty good shake to get everything combined in the uh, in the jug. I mean, once you've got it shaken for about a minute, I mean, you're not going to have to reshake it throughout the process. Mm -hmm. You just initially want to get it agitated before you start your application. Gotcha. Okay. So let's talk about the rolling. I know this is uh, kind of where we get into the nitty gritty and you probably have as many different rolling techniques as there are contractors applying it. But um, how can you roll the product so that you get it evenly on the floor? Like what do you recommend as the best method to apply it? So, you know, first of all, when we're rolling these sealers, we want to treat them more like paint and less like a waterborne floor coating. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is, you know, with all the products in the palm and line, you know, our finishes and our other sealers, you can pretty much pour them on the floor and just push them around a little bit with an applicator and mm -hmm. they'll level out and everything will be absolutely seamless. Where with these products, the coverage rate, it's meant to go down a little bit thinner. Um, our jug for White Seal Nature Seal indicates that you've got a coverage rate somewhere in the neighborhood of five to 550 square feet per gallon. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, I'm pushing towards that 550 per gallon, putting it on thin. When we're rolling, you know, I'm doing a lot of feathering, just going forward. And when I, as I'm feathering, if I see any little ridge where I had a little line come off of the edge of the roller, I'll mm -hmm. go back and I'll hit that again with the roller. Um, you know, while these pigmented products do require a little bit more patience and application, um, I would uh, tell contractors that they should not be afraid to, hey, if you see a little line from that you missed when you were feathering, don't be afraid to touch it again and push that out. You know, because the, the, the more evenly we can get it distributed throughout the floor and the flatter we can get that application, the better off we're going to be. Okay. Yeah. So let's, let's dig into that just a little bit more. So you're talking about rolling the product. Now, uh, you're rolling out of a bucket, right? You're, you're dink, du uh, dipping and rolling. Yeah, I definitely, for these products, um, you know, again, you know, most waterborne products can be poured directly on the floor and worked out of a puddle. I feel like dipping and rolling out of a bucket gives you a little bit more control of mm -hmm. that coverage rate and a consistent coverage rate leads to a consistent color throughout. And so what I like to do is give it a dunk in the, in the bucket and work out very, I'd say defined sections, you know, mm -hmm. maybe four feet wide by six feet long for example. And gotcha. where with rolling, you know, as people that have rolled finish know, you know, one of the benefits is you can go cross grain with mm -hmm. these products. I try to whenever possible to go um, parallel to the, uh, to the grain of the wood or with the board seams, kind of keep everything squared off that way. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So that makes sense. Um, and, and I guess what just for people that are trying to visualize this, what you're describing is like you pick a section of the floor, let's say the floor runs this way, you're gonna dunk out of a bucket and then spread it on the floor and feather out with the boards and kind of work your way down in that, let's say you pick a four foot section. So you're gonna do, you know, four by six, four by five, and then you're gonna step back, do another four by five feather into the area you just did and then keep stepping back and then turn around and come down, uh, back down the floor parallel to the section you just did, correct? Absolutely, it's exactly what I'm talking about. And so in reality, our, we'll call it our wet edge mm -hmm. versus our dry edge, our, that edge is always gonna be parallel 
to the, the, the direction of the floor. So we don't want to have those hard stops going across the grain of the wood. That's going to really help us if we do have any, you know, small marks that we may have missed from the edge of the roller because now they're going to be more consistent with the grain of the wood or with a board seam and so they'll be less visible. Right. Okay. I got gotcha. you. Um, so as you're uh, going down the floor and around, are you only cutting in the edges far enough for the section that you're about to do pretty much? That's a great question. Yeah, I definitely, I want my, uh, if I've got a cut in person working with me, mm -hmm. I really don't want them to get too far ahead of me. Um, just because, you know, they get too far ahead and it starts to dry again, that's another opportunity for us to possibly see a, you know, we'll call it a stop mark in the floor. Sure. And, you know, and while you can certainly use a variety of applicators for your cut in, you mm -hmm. know, one of the little tricks that I like to do is, uh, head to the paint store and get a, uh, a high quality microfiber mini roller, one of those small diameter ones, yeah. about the same diameter as a roll of nickels. I don't yeah. know, maybe they're two or three inches wide and use that to cut in with. Because gotcha. again, that does a little bit better job of, you know, you don't have that hard stop line that you get with a square pad. So. Right, right. Yeah, and the the other thing I recommend, because I, I tend to coat uh, out of a bucket in the method you're describing on my first coat. Um, I found first coats are always the hardest for Absolutely. me to do. Um, I, final coats don't scare me at all. Um, middle coats obviously don't scare me at all. But that first coat is where you can get stop marks, you can get uneven marks on the wood, you can get thick and thin spots and things like that. And then you multiply that to the nth degree whenever you have a pigmented sealer. So, um, the one thing I found when I'm coating out of a bucket uh, and doing that, you know, four by six area or three by five or whatever you decide to pick as a good amount for each dunk on the roller is to work your way down and get the edge of your roller right along the edge of a board and work Absolutely. your way down that way. Because as you turn around and come back, here in Denver, at least, by the time you get back to the other end of that room, your finish is probably starting to set up, or your sealer is starting to set up on you. And so it's really easy to get that lap line. But if you roll right along the edge of a board, um, it's really hard to see where you're overlapping. So No, absolutely. I, I, I love that tip. And, you know, and these are, I mean, throughout the industry, we've got a lot of products that mm -hmm. have this same effect to them. And these products are a little bit more nuanced than a typical waterborne sealer and finish package. And so contractors will come up with their own little, you know, tips and tricks with working with them because I've seen a few guys out there that depending on the size of the room, I mean, if they're working on a 10 by 15 room, um, you know, they may do a dunk in the bucket and take that roller and go wall to wall with it, mm -hmm. almost like somebody that was working a T-bar. Because yeah. when they do one long run like that, um, they're not lifting the roller off of the floor. And so again, that's one less opportunity to get a stop mark in the floor. But, yeah. you know, getting started and doing more of this sort of grid work, you know, four feet wide by five feet long, Mm -hmm. parallel to the wood that's a good place to start absolutely and as you get more comfortable with the system you'll be able to we'll say find ways that are a little bit more expeditious to get it done yeah for sure and and to that point i always recommend if guys haven't used this before you know try it on a panel or try it in let's say one bedroom just pick a bedroom tape off the doorway and then <laughs> do that let it dry before you try the whole house um for sure so uh nature seal um has a little bit less of the white pigment in it on some of these products i've heard um if you're a little bit uncomfortable with the heavily pigmented products then you could 
uh, bump it down to a little bit less pigmented and then double coat. So could a contractor do that? Could he apply like two coats of nature seal to try to get up to a coat of white seal or something like that? Absolutely. And, and really, I'm a big fan of applying two coats of these sealers. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, you could also look at it from a standpoint, they want the raw stuff, they want the raw appearance, but they want to get a, you know, obviously the whole point of this is to get a consistent look throughout. Mm -hmm. Do two really thin coats of Nature Seal. Do them back to back. You don't need to abrade between, provided those two coats are within a 24 hour window, which in general with both of these products, you know, because we've got that 24 hour window, I'm, these products can be abraded, but I don't like to abrade them. I don't like to abrade a waterborne sealer unless I absolutely have to. So my advice would be, hey, when you're doing your samples, show your client a sample of Nature Seal with two thin coats. Mm -hmm. um, that's going to get you that raw appearance. And what happens with that second coat, it really gives you the opportunity to get consistency throughout the project. So I my advice is go into it knowing that you're going to do two coats of sealer. Now, if you do one coat of nature seal and you want a little bit more white, you could do one coat of nature seal and one coat of white seal. So you can intermix these going from, you know, from coat to coat. Yeah. So uh, I guess my question with that is if I guess this is curiosity. If you were to go a coat of nature seal and a coat of white seal, would you want the white seal to be on the second coat? Um, um, would that be easier? I think so. I mean, because you'd still you'd have the the pores of the wood, you know, starting to get closed off initially by that first coat of nature seal. Now we've got the white seal sitting a little bit more on top. And again, we're going to still dip and roll that coat of white seal. Uh -huh. That's going to make things a lot easier. Um, so yeah, I, if we were, if we were going into it saying, yeah, this is going to be one coat of each, I would do the nature seal first. Okay. Gotcha. Awesome. Um, can you apply these products over a stained floor? And if so, is there like a shade of stain you would stop at or what's that going to look like? Um, so to answer the first part of the question, can they be applied over stain? Yes. Um, where, mechanically, everything is going to be fine. They yeah. will, I mean, we will not have any issues with adhesion, with crawling, contamination, anything like that. Now, uh, where we could potentially run into problems, which is the money part of this job, is aesthetics. Mm -hmm. So my advice is if you're going to use either one of these products over a stained floor, that stain should either be a white or a gray. Yeah. If it's anything that's got any brown, any red, any of the above in it, um, you know, unless that's a look that somebody specifically wants, it's just not going to be, uh, I don't think it's going to be a good look. Yeah, yeah, and probably more specifically, if somebody's expecting it to come out looking like a ceruse floor with white in the grain, it's not going to look like that. It's just going to look like you've got a cloudy, foggy finish on top of exactly. a dark background. So, right, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that makes sense. And then uh, what did you say the hot coat time was on these? It's inside 24 hours. Uh -huh. I mean, and, you know, the longest that you would wait for either one of these products to dry between coats would be three hours. But... You know, depending on the climate and the time of year, I mean, I've seen recoat times, you know, hot coat times as quick as, you know, two hours. Gotcha. If it's dry enough to walk on, it's dry enough to coat. Okay, gotcha. So as soon as it's dry and you can walk across it, you're ready to right. go. Right. Okay. And then I think you mentioned this before, but, but your recommendation would be seal and then coat with the first uh, coat of poly, and then buff, and then final coat, as opposed to buff after the sealer, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm only going to abrade my sealer um, 
with these products, if for whatever reason I've lost my 24-hour window, uh -huh. or if there was something aesthetically that needed to be addressed or evened out, I might abrade it. But again, that's going to be with a brand new um, maroon pad, 220 maroon pad. Okay. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I'm a much bigger fan of getting sealer down, getting my first cone of waterborne finish over the top, and then giving it a good abrasion after that to get everything smooth. Okay. And then um, speaking of that abrading, how do you recommend repairing the product? Let's say you've got a stop mark in the floor or you've got a, a mark where your cut-in pad um, meets the field and, and you want to even that out a little bit. What's the best way to do that? So, you know, depending on the size of this, we'll call imperfection that needs to be addressed. You know, first we'll just start with a maroon pad or maybe some 220. And we're, and we're, are we talking about an area that we're just repairing the sealer or has it got a coat of finish on it now? Ooh, now you want to make me ask both. So if it's just the sealer, um, you know, obviously anytime we're doing a repair with this type of a product, if we can board isolate through the use of blue tape and if need be creating some what I like to call artificial board seams because it never, never ceases to amaze me how the one board that needs to be repaired is an eight footer. Uh -huh. um, and there's only about three inches that are affected. So I'll, uh, I'll tape off the, the board seams, the long ends, and then I'll, I'll make an artificial seam somewhere, you know, just past that imperfection. And yeah. then we're going to work it with a maroon pad or maybe even 220 tape to try to reduce the, you know, the aesthetic of that particular spot. So are you talking about like sanding it down until the board looks even and then just applying a thin coat of white seal or nature seal over the top of that board? Yeah, and the, what I might actually do first is, you know, go ahead and address it with an abrasive and then just use a damp cloth, you know, a damp towel to see if it pops back up because I think everybody has had the experience of at least once where Everything in the floor looks great. The sealer is dry and they're ready to put down that first coat. Yeah. The first coat of waterborne hits it and all of a sudden things start to pop up everywhere. And so we can yeah. do a little bit of a dress rehearsal for that finish coat by using a damp rag on that repair spot to see how it looks before gotcha. we go to our next step. Yeah, that makes sense. And then that, that also makes sense for any spot that you're um, concerned of to even before you do the repair just to see what it will look like with finish on top so no absolutely and because if by by you know trying to work this area with just a braiding with you know 220 tape or mm -hmm. you know a 220 maroon pad um if that's not going to get it done now we're going to take that taped off board and you know we're going to probably take it down to bare wood and we're going to build it back up again with sealer to get it to match so yeah. Um, you know, the more times you touch a touch up, the more, the better chance you've got of screwing it up. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a fine dance to, uh, coat because you've got to go quick enough that you're not touching it, um, or retouching it when it's setting up, but, uh, you also have to make sure you even everything out. So, right. Um, well, uh, anything else you want to highlight about uh, White Seal or Nature Seal? Yeah, there is one other thing that I wanted to mention, because um, you had asked about stains. Uh -huh. um, and then the other question I frequently get asked about is species. Uh -huh. And so Brazilian Cherry, Exotics, Walnut, you know, again, these products will work over those species. You know, that is something that if somebody's asking for it, show them samples before you do the whole thing full scale yeah. because your description of sort of a foggy, hazy looking floor yeah. in large part, if you've got an Ipe and you put nature seal over the top, um, it's not going to be cherused. It's going to have more of a, a white frost over the top. And hey, if that's what they want, give it to them. But, you know, you just want to make sure that they don't go into this. Um, not truly understanding what that's going to look like on that species of wood. Sure. Yeah. Good point. Good point. 
And, oh, and, the, and the other thing, sorry, you can finish up, and I got one more question. Oh, no, I was going to say is, and the other thing to keep in mind, and in the trade, we don't think about it this way, but, you know, white oak, it's also a darker species of wood. Uh -huh. Not to say that, I mean, and in, in, uh, day in, day out, both of these products are being used over white oak more than anything else. Yeah. But that's where the dip and roll out of the bucket is really going to be your friend because you got a lot of variation in color with white oak. Uh -huh. And so if you work out of the bucket going over white oak, that's going to really help it be more consistent. And, you know, and then the last thing to keep in mind is so we're using the sealer, we're rolling it on, we're working out of a bucket, we've got everything great. You know, the first coat of finish, I like to work that out of a bucket as well, just mm -hmm. because, and this is gonna be the exception and not the rule, you could run into a floor, a white oak floor, that 99 times out of 100, after you seal it and put down the finish, everything's gonna be perfect. You can get that 1% of the time where as soon as you start applying that first coat of finish, the tannin's going to fire. Mm -hmm. If you're working out of a bucket and, you know, going forward, you kind of put your wet into the wet instead of plopping down your roller on that dried sealer, um, it's going to really help you eliminate the possibility of any uh, applicator marks on that floor, if that makes sense to you. It does, yeah. That's a good suggestion. The, uh, the one thing I wanted to highlight and ask you about um, you had mentioned that this is a good solution for um, whitening a floor and avoiding potential problems you get with a white stain like a white oil based stain so why don't you describe a little bit like what are some of the issues you can get with a with a white stain and then why this avoids that um you know in my time in the industry white stain on white oak has usually been yeah, the suggestion has been made not to do it. Uh -huh. um, I know there's at least one manufacturer that puts it on their label that says, you know, don't use this stain over white oak because of the reaction or the potential reaction between the wood and the white stain. Uh -huh. And not every, you know, as we know, every single board and every floor is different. And you could apply that white stain on a white oak floor and in large part it could look great and then you'll have a half a dozen areas that you'll have green looking boards, brown looking boards, mm -hmm. and it's all related to the wood itself. And so by using one of these sealers, um, it's minimizing that possibility. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, I've, I've seen that as well um, related to like, bleaching of wood and then white staining over the top of that and then getting some of the green effect or uh what have you so um all right well so i think we probably address this a little bit but if somebody was going to mess this product up um, and we all find creative ways uh, to do that what are the easiest pitfalls that you could avoid with nature seal or white seal um if you don't know how to roll, this is the project that you want to learn how to roll for. Mm -hmm. um, you know, don't think that you're going to be able to cheat the instructions and pull it with a T-bar and that because you're really good with a T-bar, your floor will be just fine because that's probably not going to be the case. Um, putting it on too thick, um, 5 to 550, don't be afraid to be at that 550 per gallon mark. Thin the wind most definitely. Um, because while this product will flow and level, aesthetically it's just not going to look as good because if you've got thicker spots, um, it's going to show. Okay. So a thin, consistent coat applied with a roller is going to be good for what ails you on these projects. That makes sense. And if you want it to be more intense, then you double apply it. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. If you put down one coat of Nature Seal and you're like, nah, it just it needs to be whiter. You just put mm -hmm. White Seal over the top of there, two coats of White Seal. So, gotcha. Awesome. Well, Gene, 
always a pleasure. Thanks for coming on and uh, thanks for all the info. And I hope that's going to be super helpful for guys who are wanting to um, use this product and create this aesthetic. So appreciate the time. Hey, thanks for having me. All right. Appreciate it, guys. Hope this uh, is helpful and we'll see you on the next video. Bye.